It is great to see you on this beautiful, beautiful fall morning. Absolutely lovely, the sun shining, blue skies, the moon was over in the, uh, the western skies. Just a great, 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 great morning. I want, to, I want to read from Psalm 81, just a few verses as we get started. And then we're going to bless the Lord today. Psalm 89 says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. That's a, that'll be your anthem forever. In other words, you want to know what you're going to be singing for all eternity? Of the mercies of the Lord. Uh, you and I, if we were to look at our own resumes, resumes of, uh, uh, of sinful deeds, sinful acts, sinful uh, attitudes of the heart, it's like, you know, miles long, and the Lord says, forgiven. Uh, his mercies swallow up our sin in the person of Jesus Christ the one who died for us. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. It's in here and it's bubbling up, but I'm going to declare it to my generation. For I have said, mercy, and this is a quote, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. The psalmist is declaring the mercies of God. He continues a little later in Psalm 89 and says, And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. O oh, Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O oh, Lord? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we come before you and we declare your mercy today. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Lord, we come before you. We recognize that the, 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 uh, the, the, our sins were nailed to the cross. Our, our, our issues were covered through Christ. I thank you for your tremendous mercies. Lord, we revel in the, in the cross of Christ today, declaring the mercies of God, and we shall sing forever of the mercies of God. Amen. Let's stand and bless his name today.
Endless love 
Jonas, thank you so much. You may be seated. Let's thank Jonas. I really appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much. You and your family are a very, very special part of our fellowship and our lives. We really love you all. Thank you so much. It is good to see you. Um, again, a beautiful, beautiful fall morning. A um, couple of the brothers aren't here with us. We'll pray for them. Uh, Danny Klebe, Steve Smith are in Knapp Station um, at the church there. Um, uh, doing special music and exhortation, so we should just take a moment and ask the Lord to bless them and, and bless the hearers as well. So fa let's do that. Father, I come before you. I thank you for uh, just the, uh, the gift and anointing uh, on both Danny and Steve. I thank you that, uh, Lord, they've, they have found a, a, a sense of your presence and the move of your spirit as they, as they work together, and I do thank you for this opportunity today. I pray, Holy Spirit, would you move? Would you not only move through them, but I pray you'd move in them as well. Lord, that they would come away, uh, not only having been used by you to bring blessing, enlargement, encourage, a challenge to others, but Lord, that they too would walk away edified. They would walk away built up. And so, Father, we bless them today and bless that uh, church in, in Knapp Station as well. Amen. Good. Um, Let's see. Darlene's not here today. She uh, she she's gonna miss you all. That we were we were in Canton last week, which was really nice. hadn't uh, hadn't been to a Sunday morning service in Canton for a long, long time. It, I think it boy probably been a year and a half pre-COVID. I think um, something like that. Uh, so it was uh, it was great to be with them. Darlene is not with us today. Uh, our daughter Louisa and her husband are both not feeling well. So Darlene is helping uh, take care of the four children. Uh, while the while the parents are are, are feeling poorly, so um, blessings on the Tabalt home and Darlene as she as she cares for them. She uh, uh, misses misses all of you when we're not here. So let's see, um, Donna, I see you. We're gonna pray for you right now. So I want some of you saints to gather around Donna right now, if you could. We're gonna I we're continuing to pray for you, pray blessings, uh, just for the for the touch of God. As we, uh, as we pray, there's a section of Scripture, um, as we read through the Gospels, um, the first Gospel, the Gospel of Matthew, um, gives us some of the details of Jesus uh, coming, uh, his birth, and then coming into ministry. Then chapters 5, 6, and 7, uh, some profound teaching, the Sermon on the Mount. But then after that, chapters 8 and 9, really speak of the power of Jesus to touch nature and to touch lives. Uh, we see the wind and the waves obeying him. We see Jesus ministering forgiveness and healing to a paralytic. Uh, we see Jesus uh, restoring a woman to life. Um, we, see, we see blind men healed. Uh, we see those who can't speak able to speak again. And then in chapter 9, it says this, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. It is the work of Christ to touch our lives, to touch the totality of who and what we are. Um, and uh, certainly there's a a promise of, e of eternity and, and transform bodies through the resurrection that, is, that we're waiting for when Christ returns. But right now, we're experiencing the down payment, the deposit. And so I pray for you, my sister. I pray for healing in Jesus' name. Just as, just as, just as Jesus healed a paralytic, just as Jesus restored a girl to life, a woman was healed, just as two blind men were healed, just as a mute man was able to speak, just as a centurion servant was healed, just as a leper was cleansed, just as Peter's mother-in-law was healed as well, in the name of Jesus, I say, Donna, be healed. Be healed by the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, you're good. God, you're good. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, you're faithful. You're faithful. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God, touch our sister. Amen. Thank you, sisters, for gathering around her. And we're going to continue to pray for you. Touch of God. Amen. Good. Um, I want to mention we've got uh, a lot of things happening, so I'm going to take a few minutes and share some of them right now. Um, first of all, we are collecting information for the 2022 uh, church directory which will include Moira, Potsdam, Madrid, Canton, and Richfield Governor. Um, the information sign-up sheet is online. If you can't find that, let me know. I can get the, uh, uh, I can find that for you online. And then if you, uh, uh, if you haven't already sent a picture uh, or have an old one on file, uh, let me know. We can get a picture taken today before we leave. Uh, that way we can compile a directory for, uh, for 2022. Um, secondly, um, boy, today's the 24th. This coming Saturday, there's a, uh, a fall party over at CFC Potsdam. Uh, P CFC, Can uh, Madrid, rather. Yeah, getting my uh, locations confused. CFC Madrid, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 2 to 4 o'clock. Um, and a lot of games and uh, just a lot of fun uh, for uh, the young people. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Um, if you have any questions, uh, otherwise just show up, have a great time. Uh, we are collecting candy uh, to distribute. If you have candy you'd like to bring, there's a couple of ways you could do it. One, well, before Saturday, maybe the best way to do it would be to get it to Madrid via CFA, one of the CFA families. That might be a good way to, to get it out there. Otherwise, just uh, head to the event a little early and uh, bring some candy, just for distribution for whoever shows up in terms of the kids. Um, Next thing is on November 14th, Sunday evening, 6 o'clock, there's going to be a, we have an annual meeting uh, for the churches every year. Uh, and this is a it's, a, it's a combined business meeting, but it's primarily spiritual business. Uh, a lot of times we think of, you know, annual meetings, we think primarily of uh, uh, the nuts and bolts and the mechanics of uh, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the organization from a, uh, you know, a, a kind of like a, how do we run this place? That's part of it. But really, this annual meeting is a spiritually vision-casting time uh, where we take stock of what God's doing spiritually, where we look ahead. Uh, and so we're going uh, uh, to be doing that on Sunday, uh, November 14th at 6 p.m. If you're an official member, we urge you to be there. If you're not a member and you'd like to come, you're more than welcome. We'd love to have you. Um, among other things, we're going to be uh, affirming uh, by a congregational vote uh, a new uh, elder, Paul Brown. Paul Brown, I think a lot of you do know, some of you might not know him, but Paul has been part of the church uh, off and on for a long time. Um, he actually uh, started attending in 1983, uh, which is a few years ago, um, and then he went to Syracuse, uh, was on staff with Believer's Chapel. Then he went to Boston. He got his, uh, his master's degree in divinity there. Then came back to the North Country, was serving as an elder and uh, uh, helping out particularly with college ministry for a number of years. And then he went to Chicago. He got his uh, doctoral de uh, degree at uh, um, what was, uh, which? Trinity, Trinity Evangelical uh, Theological Seminary. So. Um, 
uh, uh, the uh, his his a, a lot of his children went to Wheaton. You mentioned Wheaton, yeah. A lot of the a lot of his uh, children did. Um, so he's back in the North Country for the past three years. Uh, what a tremendous blessing! So uh, we're looking to reinstate him as an elder, uh, and uh, he has a particular emphasis in the area of teaching, um, and he really has helped us a lot uh, with the uh, uh, in particular in a number of ways, but in particular with the fall campaign this year and last year, uh, helping to compile the material and prepare the pastors. So uh, he's a great brother. If you have any questions about Paul, let me know. And the, the way it would work, just so you know, um, when, we get, when we look for the amen from the members, um, if there's ever uh, a vote like that and you just don't know the individual, feel free to just check abstain. In other words, you're just not sure. Uh, you don't know enough about the person to give the amen, that's fine. Um, otherwise, you just give an amen or you say, not an amen. Um, and that's, that's allowed, and that's what we're looking for. So we'll do that on no November 14th. So, um, and there'll be other, uh, other business. But primarily, as, as you know, what's working in my spirit is I really feel like it's going to be a time for us to understand the call of God on us to get refreshed in the mission of God uh, for reaching not only our region but the nation. So that'll be Sunday evening. Uh, November 14th over at CFC Madrid. Um, let's see, the following week, Thursday evening the 18th, we're going to have a special event here. Uh, one of the pastors on staff, Eric Trelease, um, Eric has preached here a couple of times. Eric has a, a gifting uh, really with an emphasis on missions and evangelism. And so I'm asking Eric as part of uh, his ministry to us, uh, to put together a time where we could come together and we could, uh, we could in a sense, hold a, uh, a workshop on how to grow the church. In other words, how to receive those whom God brings into our midst. How can we, how can we effectively uh, reach our community? Now, one of the things he's been doing is uh, through the campus ministries, he's been really doing a great job of mobilizing the, the students and the young adults to reach the campuses. But what I told him was, I said, you know, downtown Potsdam and the church, you know, the university environment there and in Canton, it's not the same in Richville. It's not the same in Mawire. It's a, it's a different uh, demographic. And so I said, what I want you to do is I want you to take those timeless principles of the Word of God and I want you to, in a sense, help us unpack them for our unique situation. I mean, people are people everywhere, but a small town is a little different than a larger area where you've got, you know, how many, you know, 6,000 young people all, you know, that descend on these, on these towns. Um, I said, I want, I want you to help us stir it up. So he's gonna do something that's gonna be partly him presenting, but partly you as well, in a sense, sharing some of the things God has shown you. So that'll be November 18th on a Thursday night. Uh, I will not be here for that. Uh, I'm going to be that week. The plan is for me to be in uh, Cartagena, Colombia with Alan Daniels uh, with the, uh, the group of churches down there. Uh, some of you know that there's a group of churches we've connected with, uh, 34 churches, um, and they, uh, they are looking to me to provide apostolic oversight to their, to their network of churches. Um, the lead apostle, Alejandro, uh, passed away four or five months ago, and so his, uh, uh, his son-in-law, who's been set in, uh, he and I are continuing to connect. Uh, great young man, um, uh, Luis is his name, uh, fantastic brother, uh, and so he's getting in the saddle with this group of 34 churches around Cartagena, Colombia, and uh, very eager for me to come down. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be heading down with Alan Daniels, and then possibly making another trip in February, so that'll be, uh, that'll be uh, some things coming up in November. More short term, next Sunday, we are going to have a meal after the service right here. Um, uh, Pam Lachance is gonna organize that, so Pam, thank you very, very much. Um, she'll, she'll organize it, she told me not to worry about anything, so I won't, um, and uh, so she'll, uh, she'll organize that for next Sunday right after the service, and uh, uh, that'll be good, good time of fellowship. Uh, also want to mention, in terms of the campaign uh, in the book of Judges, we're continuing. We've got a few weeks left. We've got the small groups, one here on Wednesdays at 6.30, one over at the Myatt's home on Thursdays at 7. Even if you haven't been involved, not too late to get involved. Um, 
And so uh, we'll, we'll be wrapping up the series on November 7th uh, in just a couple of weeks, uh, but uh, not too late to get involved with that. So um, anything else I'm overlooking in terms of just things coming up, announcements and other? All right, good. Let's do this. Let's receive an offering. And then if there's anyone with a testimony, we'll maybe share a testimony or two before we release the young people. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the blessings that you've poured out. I thank you for the, uh, for the ministry of the Spirit. Uh, these are exciting times. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you that we can be a part, um, that somehow by our, our you're, you've called us to be participating in the work of the ministry. That's amazing to me. Uh, and so thank you that we can do that, our time, our talents, our treasures, everything devoted for you. We bless you now as we give in Jesus' name. Amen. Clyde, thank you. Um, any testimonies? Anybody, uh, something you'd like to share? Pam, either from your seat or from up here, whichever you prefer. Get in. encounter with the Lord. Pam, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Hmm. sister-in-law. What's her first name? Okay. Father, I lift Lynn to you, and uh, that's sad. It's very sad. Uh, do ask. Lord, your word says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Lord, I know that you're near the brokenhearted, and so I pray that as Lynn in the midst of sorrow calls out upon you that she would know the presence of the Lord in an amazing way, life-changing, transforming presence of God in the midst of this uh, terrible tragedy. Father, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good. Good. Great testimonies. Thank you, Pam. Anybody else? All right. Well, uh, young people that are going to be heading out, I'm going to have you stand, and I want to pray for you. Father, thank you for the ministry of the Word. And I pray today that it would be just anointed by the Spirit of God, or that you would communicate your heart to each of these young people in a profound way. Lord, I, I thank you that... Encounters like this can be profound and memorable, really transformative, and so I look for that. Minister by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'll excuse you then. And let's open our Bibles. We're going to be looking at the book of Judges. In chapter 10. And uh, this is a great, uh, I, I hope you're enjoying the study in the book of Judges. I really have been. Um, 
and uh, <coughs> the uh, um, I've described it as a portion of the Bible that's probably not as familiar to most of us as other portions. Um, uh, I, I really don't generally hear a lot of preaching from the book of Judges. There are a couple of passages um, that uh, I hear uh, periodically, but not that often. So it's not, it's not uh, the most well-known book in the Bible, but certainly is very, very profound. And I, and I think what we're learning is, is absolutely, I mean, it's just like really, really inspiring in terms of the, uh, the heart of God, in terms of the mercy of God, in terms of, a, of an understanding uh, of God's desire for a people uh, that have a heart for him. Um, so it's really been a great study. I hope you've been enjoying it. Uh, the section we're going to be looking at today uh, deals with Jephthah, uh, one of the judges, and in a sense, what was going on before he comes onto the scene, and then his, um, uh, his the initial section uh, dealing with Jephthah. And uh, we've looked in this series at what we call the judges cycle. And the cycle is this, of a people who are, in a sense, walking with the Lord. They've experienced the testimony of God's goodness, uh, but then they forget him. They do evil in his sight. Uh, they experience the, uh, the consequence of sin, which, by the way, I want to say the consequence of sin is an expression of the mercy of God reaching out to get our attention. It gets our attention. It really does. Um, uh, experiencing consequences can be one of the best things we can, we can have in terms of wake-up calls, so to speak. And so they experience the consequences of their sin. They call out to the Lord. The Lord then raises up these judges. The judges were spirit-filled warrior deliverers who delivered the people of God from their oppression as they repent before God and also ministered judgment to the nations that had departed from the Lord and were engaged themselves in horrible sinful acts. And so we find then there's a restoration. The problem is, as long as the judge lives, the people continue to follow the Lord. But then as soon as the judge dies, the cycle starts over again. Uh, there are 12 judges listed in the book of Judges, and so we have this cycle going on over and over and over again. And generally speaking, the moral climate of the nation of Israel is descending during the, during the time of the judges. It's about a 250 year period of time. And it's kind of like cycling and cycling and cycling and cycling. It's, it's the, the moral depravity of Israel seems to be getting worse over the course of uh, over the 250 years. Uh, that's, that's a sad, sad thing, but that's the reality of it. What, what, what we see in this is the mercy of God and his willingness to restore when, there's, when we call upon his name. Uh, it's really absolutely profound. So we're going to be looking at the story of uh, Jephthah, what was going on before he's introduced, then his introduction, um, and then uh, part of his story. Now, in order to do this, because it's a little unfamiliar, uh, you know, terrain, biblically. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the story, and then we will read it, and then I'll share some concluding thoughts. Uh, and I think by telling it first, when I read it, I think it's going to really come together. Um, it'll be very meaningful. So I'll tell it first, uh, we'll read it, and then I'll share some concluding thoughts and maybe, maybe some application. Um, we're going to be beginning in Judges chapter 10. Um, following the previous judges, um, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. It says that they began to serve false gods again. Uh, instead of God, in, in, in spite of God's wonderful deliverance in their lives and the blessing they experienced when he delivered them, they turned from the Lord to Baal, to Ashtoreth, to the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, uh, the gods of the people of Ammon, uh, the gods of the Philistines. Here's something significant. I'll share some thoughts along the way. When you reject the Lord, when you reject the God of heaven, 
You don't remain godless. You will worship something or someone. There's no vacuum when it comes. To, you and I are made to worship. We were created to give worship. We were created to worship God. The problem is when we reject God, we end up worshiping something. Something becomes your God. Something becomes your idol. So they reject the Lord, but what happens? They embrace the, the Baals, the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, Sidon, Moab, the people of Ammon, the Philistines. Uh, well, as a result of this, they found themselves in a terrible place, eating the fruits of their idolatry. And it says in the book of Judges that they were harassed and oppressed. The New International Version says they were shattered and crushed because they departed from the Lord, because they worshiped idols, they were harassed, oppressed, shattered, crushed. Another verse says they were severely distressed. There are consequences. And what, what turns out is that what you yield to will rule over you. Sometimes when we think of sin, we think that we're going to do it. The problem is you might think you're doing it, but eventually it rules over you. It becomes your master. Sin, be sin takes over. Sin doesn't stay on a leash. Sin actually, actually takes over. I heard one preacher say, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. You can choose your sin, but you can't choose the consequences of it. And so they, the children of Israel are, they're kind of like, uh, they're, 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 somehow they're captivated by the gods of the Ammonites. What do they find? They take the gods of the Ammonites, and then they find themselves under the tyranny of the Ammonites themselves. So tasting the bitter consequences of their sin, they cried out to God. That's the right thing to do, right? Um, Absolutely. You find yourself in trouble, call upon the Lord. Um, they acknowledge their sin in forsaking him and serving the Baals. Um, now, it looked like they had a problem with too many Ammonites, you might say. The problem really was too many idols and not enough God. The symptom was the oppression of the Ammonites. The real problem, the real root of the problem was a spiritual problem. God used their Ammonite problem to get their attention to the real problem. They had departed from the Lord. I'm going to just say that that's, that's what happens in our lives. The Lord uses situations around us to get our attention. I can't tell you how many times people have come to me and said, Pastor, I'd like to meet with you, and maybe it's a couple or maybe an individual. I've got a problem. And we talk about the problem, and I'm sitting there listening. I'm kind of like, that's not the problem at all. It looks like that's the problem. But there's a deeper problem. A lot of times, there's a deeper root issue. And God uses the circumstances of our lives to get our attention in order that we might call upon him and that God would really deal with the root issue. So they call out to God and they say, we've got this problem, the oppression of the Ammonites. Uh, they cry out to the Lord. Here's where it gets really interesting. I mean, this is a kind of an interesting twist in this story. So... If you were writing the script, you'd say they turn from the Lord, they serve these other idols, they call upon the Lord, uh, and God says, okay. That's not what happened. They didn't get the response they hoped for. Instead, God reminds them of previous deliverances, basically says, I've done this before. I've delivered you from the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Midianites. And then God says to them in a single word, no, I'm not going to deliver you again. I will deliver you no more. Now you and I were shocked by that. We're like, he's God. He can't say no. He actually did. We'll read it together in a, in, a, in a bit. And God says to them, go and cry out to the gods you've chosen. Let them deliver you. So this is a moment where like, whoa, can God, can God say that? Now there's a reason why he's done this. 
There's a reason why he's done this. Because the next verse tells us that they did three things. When God said no, they did three things. Very important. Number one, they cast themselves on the mercy of God. Number two, they asked specifically for deliverance. But number three, listen to this, they put away the foreign gods from among them. They had gone to God and said, we've got an Ammonite problem. Deliver us. And God's basically saying, yeah, what's that in your back pocket? What's, what's, that, what's that idol in your back pocket? And the Lord says, no, I'm not going to deliver you. It was then that it says they put away the foreign gods from among them. God didn't say no because he was just, you know, like being hard-hearted. In essence, what we see is their repentance is being tested. Is it sincere repentance? People go to God all the time saying, God, I don't like my, my circumstances. Would you change them? And God says, I'd be happy to. But the circumstances are the fruit of something else. If you want a different, if you, you know, if you, in order to change the harvest you grow, you have to change the seed you sow. And God is looking for what we call godly sorrow. In other words, he's looking for something on the heart, on the inside. In essence, the children of Israel said, would you change, would you deliver us from our difficult circumstances? We're shattered, we're oppressed, we're crushed. And God says, yes, but let's talk about the idols in your back pocket. Let's talk about the idols in your backyard. You know, this idea of repentance is profoundly central to a meaningful and sincere and genuine encounter with God. It really is. Um, God is looking for transformed hearts. As a matter of fact, if you study uh, this, this idea of repentance and the word repent, you'll find in the ministry of John the Baptist, I'll start with him, John the Baptist, uh, first word, when he begins preaching in the Gospel of Matthew, what's the very first word in his preaching ministry? You know what it is? Repent. Oh, then Jesus comes on the scene. It says that Jesus comes teaching and preaching the kingdom of heaven. What's the very first word in his recorded message to us? Repent. The Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, he preaches a message. At the end of his message, he stops. He doesn't give an altar call. He simply says to the, to the men, of, men and women of Jerusalem, he basically says, you killed him. You killed the Messiah. Steps back away from the microphone, and they're there speechless saying, is there any hope for us? What can we do? And Peter's first word to them is, repent. In other words, genuine, heartfelt change and a recognition that what I'm doing is wrong. The seed I'm sowing is absolutely contrary to the will of God. It's not just that I want God to change my circumstances and give me a happy life. I need a heart change. And so God's getting to something on the inside. Now, it says then that they put away the gods from among them, and then they have God's attention. It says... Then the Israelites put aside their foreign gods and served the Lord, and he was grieved by their misery. At that point, in a sense, God says, okay, I'm going to do something. Now, we would think, eh, that should all be fixed immediately. Well, it's not. The people of Ammon still come to attack. The children of Israel realize they have no one to, to lead them in battle, uh, and so they decided, if anybody will lead us into battle, we will make that person the, the, the head. We'll make them the head of the, of, of, the, of, of the people over Gilead. Gilead is a, basically a large, large clan. It's not, a, it's not one of the tribes of Israel. It's a large, large clan. They said, if somebody will lead us, we'll actually make them the head over all the Gileadites. So move into the next chapter. So that sets the stage. Who will lead them into battle? God raises up Jephthah. 
Jephthah is the judge that God uses to deliver them from their oppression. Now, what we find out about Jephthah is Jephthah, Jephthah uh, like, like many people God uses throughout history, uh, comes from a, you know, a background of some uh, questionality. How's that? I made up a word. Um, uh, he's, uh, he's the son of a harlot. His, his, his full brothers, or ha rather his half-brothers, um, uh, his father's other sons don't like him. They don't think he should be really, he's not like, he's not like one of us. He's the son of a harlot. Um, and so they don't like him. They don't want to be part of the inheritance. So Jephthah ends up uh, running away from home and uh, taking up with a, uh, uh, the Bible says, a gang of scoundrels. Um, so he's, he's like so many people, he comes from a place of not like, uh, you know, greatness, but a place of weakness, you might say. His brothers uh, didn't feel he really deserved, uh, belonged, and so uh, he ends up taking up with a gang of scoundrels. But what's interesting is Jephthah's leadership anointing is evident even when he's hanging around with the scoundrels because it's evident that he's leading this gang of scoundrels. It says... Uh, so Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. Uh, so he had a leadership gift, an anointing from God. He was maybe using it uh, in the wrong context. Well, he must have made a name for himself, because when the children of Israel were looking for a leader, uh, they actually went and they sought out Jephthah. Uh, the elders of Israel came to Jephthah when they found him, they asked him to come and command the army. Uh, and you and I would write the script and say, uh, you know, the Jephthah was there with the gang of scoundrels, gang of scoundrels, and the elders come and say, would you please lead the army? And we would say, the script should read, Jephthah says, why, of course. That's not what happened. They don't get the answer they expect. Now, this is significant because this is just like we read about with when they approach the Lord. Jephthah, as a judge being raised up by God, he mirrors in his response the heart of God. He basically says to them, huh, you, 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 you hated me. You threw me out. And now you're coming to me for help? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. In other words, he doesn't, he doesn't just jump at the opportunity. Here's what's happening. The people of Gilead have hardness of heart issues. They hate Jephthah. He's the last guy they want to be their captain. And so what does God do? In order to get them to face their hardness of heart issue, he puts them in a situation where they have to get Jephthah. God uses our external problems to get to the deeper heart issues. Their problem really isn't an Ammonite problem. Their problem is an idolatry problem. And now they're facing the fact that they really have tossed Jephthah aside. Um, God uses surface level issues, problems in our lives, to board down to the bedrock issues. So Jephthah puts them to the test. He says, now, you all decided that whoever leads you're going to make him the head over all of Gilead. Does that include me, Jephthah, the son of the harlot? Can't you see the elder? They're squirming now. Oh, they're just, and you know, they're cringing. And they say before God, yes, you will be our head. Again, understand God uses the circumstances to get to the heart issues. That's so true, and you see that in the ministry of Jesus so many times. So now we're just about to have the engagement with the Ammonites. Jephthah, in tremendous wisdom, and really displaying the heart of God, before he gathers the army and just charges into battle, he actually attempts what we would call diplomacy with the Ammonites. He goes to them and he says, can we talk? Why? Why are you about to attack us? Um, what's, what's going on here? In some ways, he, he tries to make peace. I love the, uh, the scripture in, in James chapter 3. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. As much as possible, we, we try to make peace. We try to, we try to win. Um, 
And so Jephthah, Jephthah is doing that. The king of Ammon responds, and he says this. It's because when Israel came up from Egypt, they took our land. And now, some 300 years later, we are taking it back. That's what happened. We were just, we were here, you came up from Egypt, and you just took our land. Now, if we stop now, if we stop reading the story, we would think, oh, the Ammonites, just peace-loving people, just minding their own business. Israel comes up out of Egypt and just push them out of the way. That's not what happened. What happened was very, very different, and Jephthah tells them that's not at all what happened. Here's what happened. Now, the message here is that unless we repent, the Ammonites had actually revised history. Their version of what had happened 300 years earlier was a total fabrication, but they believed it. They believed it. And saints, I want to say something to you. There's an epidemic of revising of history today. There's an epidemic of it. I'm, I'm, I'm just like absolutely amazed. History and facts and truth is whatever you want it to be today. It's almost like we've lost our moorings completely. Whatever somebody wants to be the truth of what happened is suddenly the truth. And I'm like, That's, that, that isn't how it works. There's something called truth. And so what Jephthah does, he gives the king of Ammon what we might call a truth encounter. He says, that's not at all what happened. What happened was the Ammonites, out of their own pride and stubbornness and deception, have rewritten history. And so Jephthah straightens them out. He tells the real story. Here's what happened. We were freshly out of Egypt. We needed to pass through your land in order to get to where God was bringing us. We asked for permission. We asked if we could pass through your land. We told you we, we won't touch your crops. We won't touch your livestock. We just need to pass through. And you said no. So we asked again. We promised we would just pass through. We wouldn't touch your crops. We wouldn't touch your livestock. Please let us go through. And you know what you did the second time? You raised an army to attack us. And in the ensuing battle, the Lord gave us victory over you, and the Lord gave us that land. It was the Lord himself. And that's how we got the land. It's not at all what you said. You, you know, we're just, you know, you're minding your own business, and boom, we, that's not what happened. What happened was, you pursued us to attack, and the Lord gave us victory. The Lord gave it to us. And Jephthah then continues. He says, while we're talking about this, here's an idea. Why don't you keep all the land that your God, Chemosh, gives you, and we'll just keep all the land our God gave us. And he further goes on. He says, and these are some historical references. By the way, the story of actually what happened, you can read about it in the book of Numbers. Um, I think it's chapter 20, 21, 22 in that, in that area, the story of what actually happened. He says, if you were smart, king of Ammon, you would do what, the, what Balak did 300 years ago, the king of Moab. You know what he did? When he saw the hand of God on us, he decided, I'm, just, I'm not even going to attack them the king of Moab realized there's no point in attacking these people. There is something going on, and we better leave them alone. And so Jephthah says, I think you should learn a lesson from the king of Moab 300 years ago. And one more thing, Jephthah says. Why are you bringing up this land dispute now 300 years later? You're a little late to the party. Um, why now? And he concludes by saying, I haven't sinned against you. We haven't sinned against you. If anyone has sinned, it's you. The king of Ammon did not listen. He hardened his heart, and he basically went to attack. The scripture tells us the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He led the Israelites into battle, and the Lord delivered the Ammonites into his hands. The people of Ammon were soundly defeated. So it's really quite a, quite a story. There's a lot to it, a lot of little insights. And again, we'll, we'll read it in just a, 
a few moments, I think as we read it, you'll really appreciate it now that we've told the story. There's one more aspect I want to point to because this is an important part. In the process of the Spirit of the Lord coming upon Jephthah and him leading the people of Israel into battle, he made a vow to the Lord. Um, you may be familiar with the vow he made. Maybe, maybe it's going to be new to you today. But he vowed this, that when he got home, if the Lord gave him victory, that he would consecrate as a sacrifice to the Lord the first person that walked out of his house to meet him. Uh, Judges chapter 11, uh, verses 30 and 31 in the CSB, uh, Christian Standard Bible says this, If you, in fact, Lord, if you, and he's speaking to the Lord, if you, in fact, hand over the Ammonites to me, whoever comes out of the doors of my house to greet me when I return safely from the Ammonites will belong to the Lord, and I will offer that person as a burnt offering. Now, the question is, what happens? Because when he does get home, the first person that walks out of his house is his own daughter. He's got only one daughter. And, the, and he does offer her as a sacrifice to the Lord. The question is, what, is that, what does that look like? Well, let's start by talking about a burnt offering. A burnt offering refers to an offering that was complete. Nothing was held back. Certain offerings in the Old Testament were offerings that were presented. Some of it was offered in complete sacrifice to the Lord. Some of it was kept by the priests. Some of it was actually enjoyed by the people, the people themselves. A burnt offering was generally, it referred to a total sacrifice, a total consecration. Um, and so the question is, what did he do? Did he, did he actually physically burn up his daughter? You know, was she killed and grilled? Or was it figurative language? I'm going to propose to you today that it was figurative language. Um, it says that when he got home, his daughter, his only daughter, ran out of the house to meet him. It broke his heart that it was his daughter. In making the vow, he, he assumed, hoped perhaps, that it was someone or maybe something else. Hard to know. The daughter insisted, this is significant, the daughter insisted that Jephthah fulfill the vow. But she asked for a couple of months to mourn. Specifically, she asked for a couple of months to mourn her virginity, that she would never bear children, that she would never know the joys of marriage and family. Jephthah fulfills the vow, and the scripture tells us she remained a virgin. She never had children. She and her friends mourned that she would never have children. She submitted to her father's vow. We'll talk more about this after we read, but I'm going to propose to you that what happened was she was consecrated to the service of the Lord, that she was not killed and grilled um, uh, in, 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 the, in, a, in a literal sense, but that she was consecrated in the way that others throughout biblical history were at times consecrated to the service of God. And that part of what she mourned was that she would remain a virgin, that she would not have children. As in many cases, we find men and women would consecrate themselves to the Lord's service, and in that consecration, they would not get married, they would not have children. And actually, when you think about Jephthah's daughter, and you'll read this in a moment with us, um, we'll be reading it, her saying, Father, I want you to fulfill this sacrifice is an amazingly beautiful picture of an only child submitting to the will of the Father no matter the cost. A beautiful picture of an only child submitting to the will of the Father no matter the cost. We'll talk more about the vow at the end of the message. Right now, I'm going to read a lengthy passage, Judges 10, 6 through 11, 40. Probably as much Bible real estate as we've read on a Sunday morning ever. Um, uh, 
I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. If you want to follow along in that one, that's fine. If you want to follow along in your own translation, that's great too. I've chosen the NLT because it's a very good translation to listen to. And so if you simply want to listen, uh, listen to this reading of Judges 10.6 through 1140. Again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They served the images of Baal and Ashtoreth and the gods of Aram, Sidon, Moab, Ammon, and Philistia. They abandoned the Lord and no longer served him at all. So the Lord burned with anger against Israel, and he turned them over to the Philistines and the Ammonites, who began to oppress them that year. For 18 years, they oppressed all the Israelites east of the Jordan River in the land of the Amorites, that is, in Gilead. The Ammonites also crossed to the west side of the Jordan and attacked Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim. The Israelites were in great distress. Finally, they cried out to the Lord for help, saying, We have sinned against you because we have abandoned you as our God and have served the images of Baal. The Lord replied, Did I not rescue you from the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Maonites? When they oppressed you, you cried out to me for help, and I rescued you. Yet you have abandoned me and served other gods. So I will not rescue you anymore. Go and cry out to the gods you've chosen. Let them rescue you in your hour of distress. But the Israelites pleaded with the Lord and said, We have sinned. Punish us as you see fit. Only rescue us today from our enemies. Then the Israelites put aside their foreign gods and serve the Lord. And he was grieved by their misery. At that time, the armies of Ammon had gathered for war and were camped in Gilead, and the people of Israel assembled and camped at Mizpah. The leaders of Gilead said to each other, whoever attacks the Ammonites first will become ruler over all the people of Gilead. Now Jephthah of Gilead was a great warrior. He was the son of Gilead, but his mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also had several sons, and when these half-brothers grew up, they chased Jephthah off the land. You will not get any of our father's inheritance, they said, for you are the son of a prostitute. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Soon he had a band of worthless rebels following him. At about this time, the Ammonites began their war against Israel. When the Ammonites attacked, the elders of Israel sent for Jephthah in the land of Tob. The elders said, come and be our commander. Help us fight the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to them, aren't you the ones who hated me and drove me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? Because we need you, the elders replied. If you lead us in battle against the Ammonites, we will make you ruler over all the people of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders, let me get this straight. If I come with you, and if the Lord gives me victory over the Ammonites, will you really make me ruler over all the people? The Lord is our witness, the elders replied. We promise to do whatever you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him their ruler and commander of the army. At Mizpah, in the presence of the Lord, Jephthah repeated what he had said to the elders. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of Ammon, asking, Why have you come out to fight against my land? The king of Ammon answered Jephthah's messengers, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, 
They stole my land from the Arnon River to the Jabbok River and all the way to the Jordan. Now then, give back the land peaceably. Jephthah sent this message back to the Ammonite king. This is what Jephthah says. Israel did not steal any land from Moab or Ammon. When the people of Israel arrived at Kadesh on their journey from Egypt after crossing the Red Sea, they sent messengers to the king of Edom asking for permission to pass through his land. But their request was denied. Then they asked the king of Moab for similar permission, but he wouldn't let them pass through either. So the people of Israel stayed in Kadesh. Finally, they went around Edom and Moab through the wilderness. They traveled along Moab's eastern border and camped on the other side of the Arnon River, but never once crossed the Arnon River into Moab, for the Arnon was the border of Moab. Then Israel sent messengers to King Sihon of the Ammonites, who ruled from Heshbon, asking for permission to cross through his land to get to their destination. But King Sihon didn't trust Israel to pass through his land. Instead, he mobilized his army at Jahaz and attacked them. But the Lord, the God of Israel, gave his people victory over King Sihon. So Israel took control of all the land of the Amorites who lived in that region, from the Arnon River to the Jabbok River, and from the eastern wilderness to the Jordan. So you see, it was the Lord, the God of Israel, who took away the land from the Amorites and gave it to Israel. Why then should we give it back to you? You keep whatever your God, Chemosh, gives you, and we will keep whatever the Lord our God gives us. Are you any better than Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he try to make a case against Israel for disputed land? Did he go to war against them? Israel has been living here for 300 years, inhabiting Heshbon and its surrounding settlements, all the way to Error and its settlements, and all the towns along the Arnon River. Why have you made no effort to recover it before now? Therefore, I have not sinned against you. Rather, you have wronged me by attacking me. Let the Lord, who is judge, decide today which of us is right, Israel or Ammon. But the king of Ammon paid no attention to Jephthah's message. At that time, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he went throughout the land of Gilead and Manasseh, including Mizpah and Gilead. And from there, he led an army against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. He said, if you give me victory over the Ammonites, I will give to the Lord whatever comes out of my house to meet me when I return in triumph. I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. So Jephthah led his army against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave him victory. He crushed the Ammonites, devastating about 20 towns from error to an area near Minnith as far away as Abel Karamim. In this way, Israel defeated the Ammonites. When Jephthah returned home to Mizpah, his daughter came out to meet him, playing on a tambourine and dancing for joy. She was his one and only child. He had no other sons or daughters. When he saw her, he tore his clothes in anguish. Oh, my daughter, he cried out. You have completely destroyed me. You've brought disaster on me. For I have made a vow to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. And she said, Father, if you have made a vow to the Lord, you must do to me what you have vowed. For the Lord has given you a great victory over your enemies, the Ammonites. But first, let me do this one thing. Let me go up and roam in the hills and weep with my friends for two months, because I will die a virgin. You may go, Jephthah said. And he sent her away for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never have children. When she returned home, her father kept the vow he had made, and she died a virgin. So it has become a custom in Israel for young Israelite women 
to go away for four days each year to lament the fate of Jephthah's daughter. So I want to talk mostly now about the vow because I think it's very significant. Now, there are two differing interpretations. One interpretation, one common, one line of commentary will say that he actually killed her on an altar um, and, uh, and sacrificed her. The other, which I, I think is actually stronger, is that he consecrated her for service unto the Lord. And I'm going to explain some of the reasons I believe that and why I think it's so important to us. First of all, I want to say that Jephthah did not barter with God. When he says, if I win this battle, I will consecrate, I will sacrifice the first thing that comes out of my house. Again, the CSB says the first person that comes out of my house. The Hebrew language is a little unclear there. He's not bartering with God. He's not saying, you know, kind of like God, if, if I win the lottery, I'll split it with you 50-50. Um, that's not what's happening here. His vow was an expression of consecration, the kind of consecration that flows out of gratitude, that flows out of thanksgiving. We see something similar in the life of Hannah in 1 Samuel, just a few, few verses, uh, chapters later in your Bible. 1 Samuel, chapter 1, we find Hannah, a woman who is sorely grieved because she doesn't seem to be able to bear children. And she goes to the Lord and she says, Lord of armies, if you will take notice of your servant's affliction, remember and forget and not forget me, and if you will give me a son, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and his hair will never be cut. The hair never being cut is a reference to the Nazarite vow. It's a vow of consecration. So Hannah basically says, if you will remember me, I will, in gratitude, consecrate the very blessing you give to me in grateful sacrifice to you. And Hannah indeed did that. When she had her firstborn son, Samuel, she brought him after he was weaned. She brought him to the temple, and he was consecrated to the service of God. He was trained up, and of course we know of Samuel and his profound ministry uh, in the nation of Israel following the time of the judges. Samuel is considered the last of the judges. And so we find that sense of consecration flowing out of gratitude for God having moved. And I think that's what, that's what Jephthah is doing. He's not negotiating with God. He's not saying, you know, God, if, if you'll do this for me, I'll do this for you. And hey, quid pro quo, it works out for you, works out for me. That's not it at all. You and I as followers of Christ understand what Jephthah was saying. We who were dead in sins have been given life and now how do we live those lives? How are, to we live, how are we to live those lives is a better way to say it. We are to live those lives in grateful consecration to the Lord for his purposes. Having received life from death, we now live for his purposes. Romans chapter six says this to the believers, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. How are we to live our lives? In complete consecration. Colossians chapter three says this, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. There's a type of consecration that we understand that flows out of receiving the blessing of God. And Jephthah is basically saying, you bless us, and out of it is going to flow consecration. This type of consecration um, of, of, of lives is seen not only in the life of Samuel. I mentioned him. We also see it in the lives of Samson, and we see it in the life of John the Baptist. In, in all three cases, by the way, Samson, uh, Samuel, and John the Baptist, the parents were unable to conceive. God blessed with children, and those children were then consecrated to the Lord. Very interesting. John the Baptist, of course, you're probably very familiar with his story. Um, and he's living as a consecrated man. Uh, he was consecrated uh, to the Lord. So 
Jephthah's daughter's sadness, clearly from the scripture, revolves around the fact that she would not bear children. And that's significant because there were types of consecration where people would, in a sense, willingly choose to forego the, the joys, the responsibilities of marriage and family in order to serve the Lord. That was, that was part of what people would do. Uh, we find kind of a, a reflection of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 when the Apostle Paul basically upholding the single life uh, is saying, you know, single life is not bad. As a matter of fact, it's an excellent way to serve the Lord without distraction. That's the term he uses. Um, and so we understand that that can be a way to serve the Lord. Uh, some interpretations of the passage, again, um, uh, Judges chapter 11, they suggest that Je Jephthah actually killed his daughter on the altar of sacrifice. Again, a, a burnt offering means total. It means nothing left behind. Her mourning, the daughter's mourning, was over her perpetual virginity. There's no indication in the text that she's mourning her loss of life. It's more that she would not have children. Um, uh, chapter 11, verse 39 speaks very strongly to this. Listen to the New King James Version. And it was the, so at the end of two months that she returned to her father, and he carried out his vow with her, which she, he had vowed. She knew no man. In other words, it says, he carried out his vow, she knew no man. The King James is probably even more assertive in this. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed, colon, and she knew no man. Or as he fulfilled the vow, and she knew no man. I believe she was consecrated for service to the Lord, and she was willingly uh, re responsive to that. Did he kill her? I don't think so. Does it say he killed her? Not explicitly. Does it say he didn't? It doesn't say he didn't, so hence the debate. Um, you can study this uh, further. I encourage you to do it. Again, there's these two schools of interpretation. Any questions that I leave this morning will be answered by your small group leaders on Wednesday and Thursday. They have all the answers. <laughs> they have all the answers to all the questions uh, that you could ever imagine asking. Um, I want to close with Romans chapter 12, because I think Jephthah's vow was significant. I think the response of the daughter is incredibly significant. Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Clearly, poetic language in which we are offering our lives as living sacrifices. In other words, we are living for the purposes of God because of the new life we've been given. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I believe Jephthah's consecration, his vow, basically speaks to this. God, this nation needs transformation. You bless us, and we live as a consecrated people, and I personally will consecrate. Again, the CSB says, whoever comes out of the house first. By the way, some people think he was expecting a, a farm animal to come out of the tent. Unlikely that they had you know, goats and pigs and sheep in their tents at that time. That's quite unlikely, actually. Um, he probably expected a person to come out of the tent. The question was, who? But the idea was, God, we need transformation. You bless us, and we will live as a transformed people. We will live as a people wholly dedicated to your purposes. We will live for the purposes of God, not our own purposes. Saints, that one will preach. And that will preach to every man or woman who's ever come to Christ because we know, having received life from the dead, how are we to now live? We're to live for him. 
in total sacrifice, presenting ourselves, the entirety of who and what we are, as living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. It's not us paying him back. We could never pay back God for what he's done. We simply yield who and what we are for his service in joyful gratitude, having received life. We live that out. It's not a quid pro quo. It's not like, God, if you, if you save me, I'll live for you. And God says, oh, that's a great deal. I, uh, I, I, get, I get you. Whoa, of course. I'll take that deal anyway. That's not what's happening. We are saying, oh, God, you save us and we will live for your purposes. That's what's happening here, I believe, in Judges chapter 11. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Saints, I am challenged by this vow and his daughter's response to live a life, my own life, in total consecration. Having received life, how am I now living it? We need to present ourselves, the totality of who and what we are, as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. Let's pray. There's a lot of things that are touched upon in this, in this section. Issues of what we might call coldness of heart. We're having experienced the blessing of God, we wander. Issues of repentance, shallow repentance, or repentance from the depths of our heart. Many, many issues. But in some ways, the passage, and I think rightly so, culminates with the response of those who have been delivered, who then go on to live for the Lord and live for the purposes of God. And really in some ways to, to bring a conclusion to the things we've looked at. Are we living our lives today as believers, having received life from death? Are we living in total, grateful, joy-filled consecration to God. Jephthah's daughter, really an amazing and inspiring response. Yes, there's some mourning, but she willing, willingly embraced that consecration. Saints, every day is a day for us to refresh that holy, acceptable service to God. As we're together, I'm convicted today of areas in my life. I need to yield to the Lord. I want to live for Jesus. I'm going to live for Him. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present yourselves living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It only, it only makes sense living for Jesus. Father, we come before you today. We recognize that many times we've wandered, and you and your mercy, you get our attention. It's your goodness that leads us to repentance again and again. And Lord, we also recognize that sometimes we've been guilty of saying, Lord, I want you to fix the consequences, but I'd rather hang on to my sin. Father, deal with us in the deepest parts so that we might be a people wholly, entirely yielded to you living for your purposes. And knowing the fruits of that, having tasted the bondage of sin, Lord, I pray that we would now know the fruits of righteousness in ever-increasing abundance. Freedom. 
joy, peace. Father, I pray for that. Lord, I thank you for, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this amazing, amazing, amazing section. Lord, I pray that we would be challenged by it, equipped by it, encouraged by it, built up by it. Lord, I pray that as we meditate on this one, it would stick with us. Father, thank you. May we live all of our days in joyful service to you. Amen. Amen. Saints, God bless you. Hope I answered at least some of the questions about Jephthah's vow. Um, please continue to study that one and uh, the entire section. So we read uh, Judges 10, 6 through the entirety of chapter 11. I know it was a long section, but it's a great section, isn't it? Um, really is. So God bless you. Have a great day.